Good morning, class. Today we're going to talk about how uh, memory and programs interact. So this is a very important and useful topic, uh, and it will be covered in a lot more depth than when you get into your computer op architecture and operations class. But I'm going to introduce it right now just as a way to help us understand some very important concepts in programming. Uh, so our computers have memory. And if you think back to our intro course, we talked about a Turing machine. We often talk about the Turing machine having an infinite paper tape that we write zeros and ones to. We use the same model to describe uh, our actual memory in a modern PC. The difference being it's not an infinite tape. Uh, it has a set start position and a set size. Uh, so if you have 32 gigabytes of RAM, you can think of it as a tape 32 gigabytes long, uh, or 32 bits long, so having 32 squares. Uh, the other thing is we don't normally worry about bits at this point. We abstract down to the level of variables. When we create a variable type int, uh, it uses up as many of those bits as it needs to to represent its size. And you learned about all of that again in intro class. Uh, but with C sharp, you're talking uh, a 32 or a 64 bit integer. Um, and uh, longs and doubles are just different sizes for a floating point number. Uh, decimal is a slightly different uh, storage format, but they all basically break down to the same idea. You're allocating a set number of bytes to represent those. Um, now, when we run our program, what actually happens is that program gets loaded into memory. And this is why we call modern computers a stored program computer, because we don't build the computer to a single purpose. We let it do all kinds of different things with a lot of different kinds of instructions, which to do complex tasks, we write a program for. And that program just encompasses uh, complex operations using very simple uh, assembly commands. And that's kind of what the compilation process does. It takes it from an English language representation to something the machine understands. So we have the specific amount of memory that's allowed uh, that our computer has. It's physical space that it stores bits in as the program's running. And the operating system, which is a central piece of our computer uh, in a modern world, allocates a chunk of that RAM for our program to use. Now, our program can only use this chunk. It can't write to memory over here. It can't write to memory over there. It's a very important security consideration. If it was allowed to write over here, over here, where other programs have their reserved memory space for what they are doing, you could potentially overwrite what that program is and that program could do something completely different. That's a, a very common uh, hacker trick is to try to overflow a program's allowed space to put new instructions into other programs, especially if you can overflow into uh, where the operating system keeps its own program. You can overwrite parts of that and do very terrible things. So modern operating systems do not allow you to write anywhere but this memory. And how you access that memory is managed through your how your language is actually running. In our case, we're working with C-sharp, which is technically an interpreted language, so there's a VM running in the space that interprets our code for us. Uh, if it was compiled all the way down to assembly, it would be directly in the, the program talking to the CPU. But the ideas really carry across. We don't need to get down into that level to really understand it. So the first thing we have in this memory is we section it into spaces. In the first section, is the static section. And that static section is where our program instructions actually get copied. And again, we're doing an interpreted language that uses an intermediate language, so it gets compiled into intermediate language equivalent of our, our program, and that's what gets in the static section. That's what it puts there. Also, any variables that we have declared static, the space for those is allocated here in the static section. That's really what it means. So if we have a static int, for example, uh, there's going to be an integer-sized space inside that static section that holds that static value. Now, that value can be changed. It's just that that's where it's stored. That's why we use a static keyword. That's what it means. It means it's in the static section. A lot of times students think static means unchanging. Well, that is the English meaning. And in this case, we call it the static section because it doesn't grow and it doesn't shrink. It's always this size. So we only put stuff in there that we know exactly how big it's going to be. The next chunk of memory we often call the stack. And we call it the stack because it grows and shrinks like the stack data structure you learned about. 
So when we run a program, the main function allocates space for all the variables that are part of the main function, and that gets allocated right here in the stack. And as it calls other functions or other methods, any variables that they allocate in their scope then get allocated in the stack. Uh, so let's say we have a main that has some variables. We chew up some space for it, and then it calls a function foo. So we end up allocating more space for foo, and then any of its variables it declares are set into this space as well as any of the parameters that were passed into foo, those also get stored in here. And then if foo, for example, has a loop inside of it, the loop has its own scope. So any variables declared in that scope, like your int i, uh, are actually allocated for that loop. Now when your loop finishes running, that memory is released. And you can see it pops off the stack. When foo returns, all the variables it was holding go away. So it pops off the stack. And this is why we call it a stack, because it will grow out as we do function calls, and as they return, it will shrink back. It will grow out as we enter loops. When we fit exit a loop, it will shrink back. So it gives us a very nice, as the program's running, we're just moving left and right. We're consuming space. We're freeing space. Uh, it's very zen. This is also where that common exception that I'm sure everyone has experienced in the class occurs, the stack overflow exception. What that means is the stack has grown so much that it has run out of space and there's no more space to put stuff. When that happens, that normally happens because we have an infinite recursion. So a method is calling itself over and over and over and over again. And even if we don't allocate any variables, there's a little bit of memory that gets chewed up each time we do this to keep track of where we are. So it will eventually run out of space. The other reason we'll see that is if we enter an infinite loop. So if you have a loop that never exits, every time we go through that loop, we're storing a little bit of information, even if we're not declaring new variables, and that will eventually consume all the space available on the stack. That's why it's called a stack overflow, if you didn't know that. Now, there's one other piece of memory we need to know about. That is the heap. The heap is where memory that's allocated outside of scope declarations exist. Uh, and when you take the C language laboratory, you're going to do a lot of work with allocating memory using calloc or malloc or realloc. Those methods actually take some of this memory, exactly the amount you specify, create that space for you, and give back a address of where that memory starts. And all this memory is addressable. Technically, it starts at zero and it goes all the way up to the last uh, bit that you can possibly store in it. And that address just refers to where along this memory your particular thing that you're looking at is. So you'll get into more of that when you do uh, 309. Now, for modern object-oriented languages, usually we don't directly allocate that space. Instead, anything we use the new keyword with is going to create space on the heap to hold that. So when we construct, for example, a new object from a class, say maybe our Vector3 class, we've been playing with in our exercises, on the heap we allocate space to hold that Vector3, which is basically three double-sized holes that are the X component, the Y component, and the Z component, and that's where the actual binary representation of those values go. And this is why we call this a, a reference type, because if we declare a variable, uh, vector 3v equals new vector 3, what that actually is doing is it will allocate v goes here on the stack, and it references or points to where this variable, the actual x, y, and z are stored on the heap. That's why we call that a reference type. And integers and doubles and those, those are value types. So when we declare a variable of that type, that space is directly used for that. But here we're actually using the space allocated for v to hold a reference or an address of where its actual data exists in the heap. Now the other thing is because we can create other variables of the same type, rather than having that value uh, copied, like if we said uh, maybe vector 3s equals v, what we're actually doing is we're creating another variable s which points to the same object in memory. 
So those are technically the exact same object because they're allocated in the same space. On the other hand, if we created a new vector with another new vector call, we'd get a brand new one over here on the heap. So there's one other important idea to understand about the heap. So unlike the stack, which we have kind of a nice progression of growth and shrinking as things are used and uh, released, and it really works like a stack data structure, things on the heap could be released at different times. Like we might hold on to S for a very long time, and we might get rid of V immediately. So if you remember, our S was allocated here, and then V was allocated, or sorry, other way around, S and V. If we get rid of V, suddenly there is this space available to put something else in, and then there's a space available on the other side here. And over time, what happens is the heap gets pockmarked. It's got a lot of empty spaces and a lot of filled spaces, and that can be very fragmented to, to the point that we can't allocate sp contiguous space, so space that's side by side to hold a full object because all the spaces are too full. And this is where garbage collection comes in in a modern language. So garbage collection is actually goes through the heap and A, uh, frees up the space. So for example, it figures out when we're done with V that that space is all allocatable. Again, we can use it for something else. And B, when that heap gets too fragmented, it kind of grabs everything and shifts it down to make large contiguous chunks of memory that it can then use. Now the exact workings of that are actually something that has been heavily researched and developed over the past 20 years. So there's a lot of literature on it and the specific way it's done depends on the uh, language and the strategies they've adapted. By and large, thankfully, we don't have to worry too much about it. We can just assume it's doing its job and it will. Uh, unless we get into certain types of applications where it becomes very important that we do, uh, for example, are doing things as quickly as possible or have some other memory related concerns. Probably the biggest one that I deal with regularly is video games. A video game or a simulation uh, that has a visual component or a VR app, all of these things need to have uh, the ability to create a scene, a static scene from some kind of in-memory representation uh, at a very rapidly because you basically it has to present that to the user through your screen at uh, about a 1 60th of a second. Every 1 60th of a second has to be refreshed uh, or 1 30th of a second or in some cases 1 120th of a second. So you got to update your simulated world, render your updated simulated world and show that to the user. And if garbage collection kicks on, that may delay that process by a few thousand milliseconds, which means you'll actually have stutter, you'll have skipped frames. So for some applications, you don't want the garbage collector doing heavy lifting while you're running. So understanding how your uh, programming language is actually using that memory and when it would cause the garbage collector to kick on is important. But for most applications, it's not that important, like in this class, we can just assume the garbage collector is doing its work. We don't need to know the exact details. Uh, but those are things that you can learn if you're interested. There's always opportunities to drill deeper into any of these concepts. And like I said, you will revisit this idea when you take computer architecture and operations. And then if you come back and do some graduate level work, you'll probably see a lot of these ideas again, especially if you get into compiler design or something like that. So that is, in a nutshell, some of the core ideas of how programs use memory on a computer. Uh, thank you for your time. We'll see you later.